Good morning. morning. And welcome to this service of worship, both to you here in the chapel as well as those online. I encourage you to read all the announcements as printed in the bulletin. Uh, Pay particular attention to July 30th. That's our Back to School Sunday. And um, following the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have a church-wide lunch and some snow cones. So uh, even if you leave after this service, I hope that you'll come back and join in that time of fellowship. On that day, we will be praying for our students and teachers and uh, school staff. And so and blessing them. So I ask you to bring uh, your school bag on that day and we'll be doing that at the 11 o'clock service. Um, Also this month we are receiving a special offering for Murphy Harps Children's Centers, which is a very special ministry of the North Georgia Conference that provides residential and therapeutic care to some of the most neglected and abused children in our state. So I know that you will give generously to that offering as God has provided generously for you. Um, If you miss any of these announcements or want to know more, you can use the QR code in the bulletin to go to our What's Happening page. Uh, You may also register there or use the tear out in your bulletin to register your attendance or um, share a prayer request. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God.
Please stand as you're able for this morning's call to worship. The Lord is the sower of the seeds of love and redemption. Today we hear again the scriptures and sing the songs that remind us of the awesome generosity of God. Let us pray together. Loving God, sower and reaper of love, we admit to you that we are like stony fields, capable of growing goodness and sharing it around, but also we allow goodness to wither and the weeds to flourish. Your mercy has taken root in us, but we do not share enough of it with others. Your justice has grown on us, but we have not adequately implemented it. Your truth has showered on us, but we have let it run to waste. Your love has blossomed among us, but we have been slow to set fruit. Most loving God, please open the furrows of our lives to receive again the seeds of your gospel. Rain your mercy upon us. Shine your warmth and light in every dark place. And bring forth in us not the harvest we deserve, but the harvest that in your glorious love you have destined for us. Through Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. And as you are able, remain standing and turn in your hymnal to number 694 as we open today with Come Ye Thankful People Come. affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he is sent into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, we pray this morning for all those who suffer, who suffer this day from the trials and storms of life. Some of these storms are caused by illness, so we claim your healing. Some of these storms are caused by others, so we claim your grace. We claim your protection. Your protection from all the storms in our lives that push 
or pull us away from you. We ask that you be present in all the storms of life and give us the peace of your presence and the grace of your love. Lord, as summer vacations continue and students attend numerous camps this week, we pray that you provide protection and travel mercies for all those families and individuals that journey away from home. Keep them safe and continue to grow the seed of the divine in each of their hearts. Whether they experience your creation on the shores of the beach or see your majesty from the highest mountains, whether they spend time with family and loved ones or sing your praises and communion with fellow believers at camp, let your presence be known. Let your presence be felt. Lord, let your presence be tangible. May the God of grace be glorified in our rest, in our play, and in our praise. God, we pray for your creation. Yet we ask that you instill in us a call to action beyond prayer. Grant us the knowledge the resources and desires to help where help is needed most. Provide us with clarity that we may see the opportunity to serve that stand before us. Let us not only be hearers of your word or learners of your teachings, but also doers who act on behalf of you and our brothers and sisters around the world. God, it's never enough that we watch from the sidelines knowing all too well that something is amiss. It is past time we suit up with the armor and knowledge that you provide and start being doers of your word. Encourage us inspire us and remind us to that end. Lord, what began with the newness of spring continues today as new life sprouts forward from every aspect of your creation. Be it the loans and shrubs that are fed by the life-giving energy of the sun and rain, or the yearning in our hearts and souls prompted by the nudging of the Holy Spirit. We pray this morning like the fertile ground which enables growth that you can cultivate in each of us a fertile heart. Open us to the hearing of your holy word and plant within us a desire to know you as you desire so much to know us. Grow within us, Lord. Grow us, Lord. God, we thank you for the knowledge that you have granted us. Thank you for the teachings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for giving us the most perfect gift of your grace. A grace that was brought about through the birth, the life, the teachings, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus. For he showed us a more perfect way. He lived and embodied all of your teachings, all of your grace. He embodies thank you for it is through him that we live and love and learn how to be your children how to live out your grace so with one voice we lift our voices to you O oh God 
as we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, uh, beginning with the first nine verses. Hear now God's word to us this day. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mary was the church hostess, and she hated waste. Uh, after every meal, whether it was a church potluck dinner or the youth snack supper, she would save the leftovers. And then months later, people would find them, baked beans and pimento cheese sandwiches squirreled away in the back of the church freezer. No one ever ate them, but also no one ever threw them away for fear of having to fess up to Mary. Yes, Mary hated waste, but who am I to judge? Unlike Mary, I know nothing of the Depression. I've grown up in a culture of plenty that produces more disposable products than permanent ones, and yet even I, too, hate waste. I save almost everything, I have to confess, ridiculous things. Before our last move, I still had white bows from wedding gifts over 30 years before. I save random paper clips and those little twist ties from bread bags. I turn off the lights when I leave the room a habit I wish I could instill in the rest of my family. Waste not, want not, the saying goes. Thrift has long been a recognized Christian virtue, good stewardship, we call it. But then we stumble upon this little story about a sower in some soils in which Jesus tells us there's a lot of waste in kingdom work. Seeds slung haphazardly in all direction leads to a great deal of waste. Most of it won't produce anything, which is why today's farmer carefully plants the precious seeds in rows rather than broadcasting it like they did in Jesus' day. How could the sower be so wasteful. One would think that the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, wouldn't want anything to go to waste. 
Reality is, though, that there has been waste and quite a bit of it since the very beginning of Matthew's gospel. You remember the Magi. They showed up at the manger and laid costly gifts before Mary's baby, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Didn't they know that there were more practical gifts to give a newborn? How about diapers and baby wipes? How about a suitable crib instead of a feeding trough? When the baby has grown a man, a woman will take an alabaster jar of costly ointment and, and pour it over his head. We want to complain along with the disciples for such wasteful extravagance. Wouldn't it have been better to take that money and feed the hungry and house the homeless? That would be more in line with Jesus' teachings. Then there's Jesus himself. He was always speaking, speaking to great crowds, multitudes. But how many responded to his words? How many followers did he have? Just 12 and a few women that we hear about. I wonder if Jesus thought he was wasting his time that day preaching from that boat, the wonderful words of life. Then there's the Bible. You know, it, it's a, a large book. You know, really a library, a book of books. But how much of it have we read, much less comprehended? You know, all those words wasted. Most of us, to varying degrees, are like Mary, the church hostess. We don't like waste. We love efficiency and measurable results. We are Americans, right? We like for our time and energy to count for something. So we get impatient when there's a traffic jam on 400, frustrated when the appointment is canceled after we've arrived, or we have to stand in a long line at the store because the only registers that are open are the self-checkout ones, <laughs> and the people in front of us don't appear to have a clue about how to use them. We like to move effortlessly through our day, checking off the items on our to-do list, confident that we are spending our time wisely and meeting our goals. After all, in a consumer-driven society, time is money, right? And our worth is based on what we produce, is it not? But that's not the way things are measured in the kingdom of God. Jesus' parable serves to remind us that waste is a reality when it comes to spreading the good news of the gospel, to, to spreading even God's love. There's much wasted words, wasted time, wasted effort, and wasted resources. One pastor mused about the futility of preaching. He said, people don't remember anything I say, so preaching, he concluded, is a waste of time. I wonder that sometimes. Another pastor overheard a lady say she only got something out of about one in three sermons. The pastor was disheartened. Only one in three, two-thirds of the sermons wasted? Really, that's not so bad in my book, you know? I'd settle for batting 333, right? 
You think the Braves have hot bats now. Could you imagine how stoked they, we'd be if every Brave on the roster got on base one out of three times? No one in threes. Not so bad, especially when we consider that there's so much working against hearing the word in our day. We're distracted by technology, minds cluttered with information, hearts heavy with cares and concerns. It's no wonder that most sermons miss the mark with us or that the Bible sits by our bedside gathering dust without us ever plunging its depths. The poor farmer in today's parable also has the odds stacked against him. Compacted soil, hungry birds, hard rocks, fast-growing weeds. It's a reality check that there's an awful lot working against the gospel in this dog-eat-dog world. We know through hardened experience that there is a lot of waste, and I'm not talking about all that stuff that goes into the landfill. If we stopped at waste, there would be no good news. But waste is not the whole story. The good news is that while much of the seed is wasted by being scattered on less than I deal soil. Some of the seed lands on fertile soil that produces a gracious harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times, 10 times the average return. The sowing may not be efficient, but in the end it is effective. I remember a particular day when I was a stay-at-home mom of our two young sons. and I was exhausted from a day of tending to their needs, and, and I was worn out. So I plopped myself down in front of the TV, only to have a child-rearing expert appear on the, on the screen. And I thought, oh, great. Now he's going to tell me something else that I should be doing that I'm not doing. And you know what that expert said? He said, raising children is not an efficient enterprise. There's an understatement, I thought to myself. But then I began to let his words sink in. Raising children is not an efficient enterprise. Of course it's not. Nothing of enduring value or eternal worth is a matter of efficiency. And so reminded of that truth, I was able to relax and spend the rest of the day enjoying my children and sowing some more seeds. The overseas mission trip, the nursing home visit, the youth lock-in, praying and sharing our faith with someone we meet. No one can calculate the ultimate value of these. Results in God's kingdom cannot be measured in terms of hours and minutes, input and output. Grace does not compute. What seems inefficient and wasteful to us could turn out to be priceless in God's kingdom. The famous biographer James Boswell often referred to a special day in his childhood when his father took him fishing. And the day was fixed in his mind and he often reflected upon the many things that his father taught him on that day. After hearing Boswell refer to this fishing trip on multitude of occasions, someone thought to look back in the diary that Boswell's father had kept to see what was written about that day from the parent perspective. 
And turning to the date in the father's diary, the reader found a single sentence recorded. There Boswell's father had written, went fishing today with my son, a day wasted. It's too bad Boswell's father couldn't appreciate the significance of a, a day spent fishing with his son and the seeds that were being sown even while worms were being squeezed onto hooks. Every parent has reprimanded his or her child. How many times do I have to tell you? So much seems wasted. Wasted words, wasted time, wasted effort. We constantly remind, say please, say thank you, get your elbows off the table, brush your teeth, say you're sorry, do unto others. We don't know which seed we'll produce, so we keep sowing with reckless abandon and a prayer that some of it, any of it, will fall into the crevices of our hearts and minds and take root. But the reality is that most of the seed won't produce visible results, but some of it will. That's the promise of the parable. Some of it, thanks to God and to God's grace, will fall on good soil, germinate, and in time reap a gracious harvest. When Bishop Willimon's father died, one of the most comforting things he received were letters from many of his mother's former students who she had taught over a 40-year teaching career. Willimon acknowledged the frustration that comes along with teaching. He remembered his mother's disappointment when her teaching fell on deaf ears. The lesson plan that she devised in hours of preparation died in her words like a dead dog in today's class. The struggling student with whom she spent hours attempting to assist in learning flunked the exam anyway. In teaching like in parenting, he says, there is much frustration. And yet, Willimon says, here were these letters, these undeniable testimonials to the harvest of her work. I wonder if she knew how much her time and effort had meant to these people. Did she know the fruitfulness of her labors? A man who spent his whole life teaching teachers asserted the chief positive characteristic that a good teacher must have is this. Good teachers may, must be in love with the art of sowing seed, but do not need to be there for the harvest. The same is true for good disciples, my brothers and sisters. Only a person of faith can sow seeds with the trust that God will, in God's time and in God's way, produce a harvest and an unexpected, uh, unexpectedly abundant one at that. What was it Paul said? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for evidence of things not seen. Gandhi said, it's the action, not the fruit of the action that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time that there'll be any fruit, but that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know the results that come from your action, but if you do nothing, there will be no result. Listen, Jesus said, a sower went out to sow. 
So, my fellow disciples, let's keep on sowing seeds. Amanda and I will keep working on our sermons so that maybe more than one in three might hit, at least get us to first base. And you keep prayerfully preparing your small group lessons. We'll teach our grandchildren and children what's right and what's wrong according to the good book and, and live by the lessons we treat, teach them. We'll teach Sunday school to the kids and help Nate with the youth. We'll send cards to those who are struggling and visit the shut-ins and the hospitalized with great abandon. We'll share the story of the difference that Jesus has made in our life with anyone and everyone we meet as God gives us opportunity. And we'll do so without counting the cost. We'll sow seeds. We'll sow the seeds that God is calling us to sow knowing full well that most of the seed may not uh, produce the results that we had hoped for. But that's okay, because, you know, come to think of it, we may not be such fertile soil ourselves. You know, sometimes we're hard-hearted and evilly picked off by the changing winds of time and opinion. Sometimes we're shallow and lack the deep roots needed to withstand life's temptations. And sometimes we allow the cares of this world to very nearly choke the life of the Spirit out of us. I ask you, what could be more wasteful than for Jesus to lay down his life for the likes of us. God, though, doesn't consider it a waste. Moved by love for us, God keeps sowing seeds of grace and love into our lives with an enduring hope that some of it will take root in the fertile soil of our hearts. And in due season, reap a harvest of righteousness and joy beyond anything that could ever be imagined. Yes, there's waste, but praise be to God, there's also grace. And in the kingdom of God, grace always trumps waste. May those with ears to hear listen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. One of the ways that we sow seeds is through giving out of the extravagance that God has given to us. You know, we waste a lot of money, don't we? But I know that any time I give to the church, that we are good stewards of what is given, and that we do the most good we can with it. Um, you know the ways in which you can give. And so let us now offer to God our gifts, our tithes, and our very lives. Did I live with love and grace and dry the tears on some small face? Did I drink the sunlight in and look on losing as a win? Did I take the highest road? Did I repay the debt? Search me, search me. 
again, if you would, stay standing and turn in your hymnal to number 378 as we close today with Amazing Grace. It's my pleasure to introduce to you someone who needs no introduction uh, because Mary Jones has come back home. Yes. <laughs> she is coming this morning on transfer from uh, St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Panama City. Welcome back to Georgia. Uh, many of you will know her as Gertrude's daughter. And so we welcome you back home with Christian love and just have one question for you. And that is, will you be loyal to the Midway United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? We're so glad to have you back. Um, I know you'll want an opportunity to greet Mary after the service, so if you don't mind, stay here so they, they can come up. I want to thank Jared for uh, serving as liturgist this morning. Uh, you may know Jared is one of a member here at Midway, and he's also uh, a licensed local pastor, and so um, it's good um, uh, to have you back with us, Jarrett. He did not take an appointment this year, so we'll be seeing him around more. Receive now the benediction. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to direct you. May God go beside you to befriend you. May God rest above you to protect you. May God rest below you to uphold you. And may God dwell within you to comfort you now and forevermore. Amen.
So I was kidding around with is it not whole? It doesn't sound, I mean, I have some musical ability. 